Good evening and welcome to our virtual Wayland Library event. Tonight we are thrilled to have Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett with us here to talk about her new book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Dr. Barrett is among the top 1% most cited scientists in the world for her revolutionary research in psychology and neuroscience. She's a university distinguished professor of psychology at Northeastern University with appointments at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. She's also chief science officer for the Center for Law, Brain and Behavior at Harvard. In addition to her books, Dr. Baird has published over 240 peer reviewed scientific papers appearing in Science, Nature, Neuroscience and other top journals, as well as six academic volumes and has also given a popular TED talk with nearly 6 million views. Dr. Barrett received an NIH Director's Pioneer Award for her revolutionary research on emotion in the brain, as well as Guggen a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Royal Academy, Royal Society, excuse me, of Canada. In addition to her many accomplishments, Dr. Baird has testified before Congress, presented her research to the FBI, consulted to the National Cancer Institute, and been featured guest on television, podcast, and radio programs worldwide. Thank you so much to Dr. Barrett for being here with us tonight. I have just a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes. First, we are recording this session for broadcast on Waycam, which is our local cable access channel here in Wayland, Massachusetts. And we will post it on YouTube uh, and you can find that on our library's website. Second, Dr. Barrett will be doing a reading of part of her work and then we'll have time for questions. So please post your questions using the Q&A feature at any point and I will read them aloud when we get to that section of the presentation. And finally, use the chat to message me, Courtney, if you're having any technical trouble. And now that we've got that out of the way, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Courtney, um, and to everyone at Wayland Library, thank you for this um, invitation. And hi, everybody. Good evening from Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, it's um, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to interact with you today. I'm really excited to read to you from my new book, Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. And in a moment of enthusiasm, I put together a little slideshow as well um, to um, you know, illustrate some of the points that I'm gonna uh, read to you about um, to this evening. So I'm gonna ask for your indulgence. Um, I'm gonna try to multitask and um, read at the same time as I'm working a slideshow on Zoom and it's past the point where I'm allowed to drink caffeine anymore. So we should all cross our fingers and hope that this goes well. I'm going to read to you um, the lesson seven, essay seven in the book, and there should be um, ample time for questions um, uh, when I'm done. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now and we will get going. Okay. So I'm assuming everyone can see the image of the book uh, in New York, uh, just outside Times Square. Is that, can I get a confirmation on that? Courtney, anybody? Sorry, yes, thank you. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> Lesson seven, our brains can create reality. Most of your life takes place in a made up world. You live in a city or a town whose name and whose borders were made up by people. Your street address is spelled with letters and other symbols that were also made up by people. Every word in this book, including this one, uses those made up symbols. You can acquire books and other goods with something called money, <clears throat> which is represented by pieces of paper or metal, plastic, and is also completely made up. Sometimes money is invisible, flowing through cables between computer servers or traveling through the air as electromagnetic waves over a Wi-Fi network. You can even trade invisible money for invisible things, like the right to board an airplane early or the privilege of having another human serve you. 
you actively and willingly participate in this made up world every day. It's real to you. It's as real as your own name, which by the way, was also made up by people. We all live in a world of social reality that exists only inside our human brains. Nothing in physics or chemistry determines that you are leaving the United States and entering Canada, or that an expanse of water has certain fishing rights, or that a specific arc around the Earth's orbit, <laughs> or, there we go, that's the first mistake, Whew, got that out of the way, or that a specific arc of the Earth's orbit around the sun is called January. These things are real to us anyways, socially real. The Earth itself, with its rocks and trees and deserts and oceans, is physically real. Social reality means that we impose new functions on physical things collectively. We agree, for example, that a particular chunk of Earth is a country, and we agree that a particular human is its leader, like a president or a queen. Social reality can alter dramatically in moments if people simply change their minds. In 1776, for example, a collection of 13 British colonies vanished and was replaced by the United States of America. The world of social reality is also deadly serious. Ah, I've just noticed, uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry, there's a, a little glitch in um, all right let's see if that works better there we go okay the world of social reality is also deadly serious in the Middle East people disagree and even kill each other over whether a parcel of land is Israel or Palestine even if we don't explicitly discuss the fact of social reality, our actions make it real. The boundary between social reality and physical reality is porous, and we can use scientific experiments to reveal this. Studies show that wine tastes better when people believe it's, ex it's expensive. Coffee labeled eco-friendly tastes better to people than identical unlabeled coffee. Your brain's predictions, which are steeped in social reality, change the way you perceive what you eat and drink. Lesson four, by the way, discusses how your brain makes predictions um, all the time. You and I can create social reality with other people without even trying because we have human brains. To the best of our knowledge, no other animal can do that. Social reality is a uniquely human ability. Scientists don't know for sure how our brains developed this capacity, but we suspect that it has something to do with a suite of, of abilities that I call the five C's. Creativity, communication, copying, cooperation, and compression, which it describes something about your brain's architecture. First, we need a brain that is creative. The same creativity that permits us to make art and music also lets us draw a line in the dirt and call it the border of a country. This act requires us to invent some social reality namely countries, and we impose new functions on that area of land, like citizenship and immigration, that don't exist in the physical world. Think about that the next time you pass through customs, or even when you leave one town and enter another. Our borders are completely made up. Next, we need a brain that can communicate efficiently with other brains in order to share ideas, such as the idea of a country and its borders. Efficient communication for us usually in, involves language. 
For example, when I tell you that I need gas, I don't have to explain that I'm talking about my vehicle and not my digestive system, and that I plan to drive to a gas station in the near future, get out of my car, insert a plastic card into a pump for payment, and so forth. My brain conjures these features, and so does yours, allowing us to communicate efficiently. Strictly speaking, words are not necessary for social reality on a small scale. If your car and my car meet at an intersection and I wave for you to proceed first, you can observe my hand motion, guess its meaning, and use it in the future yourself. But for social reality to spread and persist, language is usually more efficient than other symbols. Imagine trying to establish and teach a country's driving laws without using words. We also need brains that learn reliably by copying one another in order to establish laws and norms to live in harmony with each other. We teach these norms to our children as we wire their little brains to their world. That is the topic of essay three, of lesson three. We teach them to, we teach them, meaning the laws and norms, we teach them to newcomers newcomers, not only to smooth our day-to-day -day interactions, but also to help those newcomers survive. I've read about explorers in the 1800s who ventured into inhospitable, uncharted parts of the world where many of them died. The expeditions that survived were the ones whose members became acquainted with the indigenous people in those regions, who taught the explorers what to eat, how to prepare food, what to wear, and other secrets of survival, in unfamiliar con in conditions and climate. If all individual humans had to figure out everything themselves without copying, our species would be extinct. We also need brains that cooperate on a vast geographic scale. Even the most mundane act, like reaching into your kitchen cupboard for a can of beans, is possible only because of other humans. Other humans planted and watered those beans, perhaps thousands of miles away. Other humans mined the metal for the can. Still other humans transported the beans to your local store, which was built by other humans with wood and nails and bricks that were manufactured and hauled by other humans, usually with techniques and tools invented by other humans long dead. You paid for the beans with money that was invented and blessed by a government of other humans. And thanks to a shared reality, all of these thousands of people were in the right place at the right time, doing the right things for you to grab that can of beans and make dinner. Creativity, communication, copying, and cooperation, four of the five C's, arose with genetic changes that gave our species a big complex brain. But large brain size and high complexity are not enough to make and maintain social reality. You also need a fifth C, compression, an intricate ability that humans have to a degree not found in any other animal brain. I'm going to explain compression first by analogy. Imagine that you're a police detective investigating a crime by interviewing witnesses. You hear one witness's story and then another and so on until you've interviewed 20 witnesses. Some of the stories have similarities. Some of the people involved uh, are the same or there's, the crime location is the same. Some stories also have differences. Who was at fault or what color the getaway car was. From this collection of stories, you can trim down the repetitive parts to create a summary of how the events might have occurred. And later, when the police, police chief asks you what happened, you can relay that summary efficiently. A similar thing transpires among the neurons in your brain. You might have a single large neuron, like the detective, receiving signals from umpteen little neurons at once, the witnesses, which are firing at various rates. The large neuron doesn't represent all of the signals from the smaller neurons. It summarizes them or compresses them by reducing redundancy. After compression, the large neuron can efficiently pass the summary to other neurons. 
This neural process of compression runs at a massive scale throughout your brain. In your cerebral cortex, compression begins with small neurons that carry sense data from your eyes and ears and other sense organs. Some of this data may already have been predicted by your brain, but some of it is new. The new sense data is passed by the small neurons to larger, better connected neurons, which compress the data into summaries. Those summaries are passed to still larger, more highly connected neurons, which compress those summaries and pass them on to even larger and more highly connected neurons. The process continues all the way to the densely wired front of your brain, where the very largest, most connected neurons create the most general, most compressed summaries of all. Okay, so your brain can make big, big fat compressed summaries of summaries of summaries. What does this have to do with social reality? Well, compression makes it possible for your brain to think abstractly and abstraction together with the rest of the five C's empowers your large, complex brain to create social reality. Usually when people talk about abstraction, they mean something like abstract art, how you can look at a painting by Picasso and see a face in the cubes, or they mean abstract math, like using algebra to rotate an object on its axes or they mean abstract symbols like using a squiggle of ink on paper to represent a number and a column of numbers to represent your spending for the month. The psychological meaning of abstraction though has a different focus. It's not about the details of paintings and symbols. It's about our ability to perceive meaning in them. Specifically, we have the capacity to see things in terms of their function not just their physical form. Abstraction lets you view objects that look nothing alike, such as a bottle of wine or a bouquet of flowers and a gold wristwatch and understand all of them as gifts that celebrate an achievement. Your brain compresses away the physical differences of these objects and in the process you understand that they have a similar function. Abstraction also lets you impose multiple functions on the same physical object. A cup of wine means one thing when your friends shout, congratulations, but another when a priest intones, blood of Christ. Here's how abstraction works. When your brain compresses data from all your senses, it integrates them into a cohesive whole, an activity that we previously called sensory integration in lesson three. Each time one of your neurons compresses its inputs to make a summary, that multi-sensory summary is an abstraction of the inputs. At the front of your brain, the largest, most highly connected neurons produce your most abstract multi-sensory summaries. That's why you can view dissimilar objects like flowers and gold wristwatches as similar, and you can view an identical cup of wine as either celebratory or sacred. I wrote in lesson two that you have a highly complex brain, but high complexity isn't enough to make a human mind. Complexity may help you climb an unfamiliar staircase, but you need more to understand the idea of climbing a social ladder to gain power and influence. Abstraction is another necessary ingredient. It lets your brain summarize bits and pieces of past experience to understand that physically different things can be similar in other ways. Abstraction gives you the power to recognize things you've never encountered before, such as a woman with snakes for hair. You've probably never seen one in real life, but you and the ancient Greeks could look at a picture of Medusa and instantly comprehend what she is because miraculously, your brain can assemble familiar ideas like woman and wild hair and slithering snake and danger 
into a coherent mental image. Abstraction also lets your brain assemble sounds into words and words into ideas so that you can learn language. In short, the wiring of your cerebral cortex makes compression possible. Compression makes sensory integration possible. Sensory integration enables abstraction. Abstraction permits your highly complex brain to issue flexible predictions based on the functions of things rather than on their physical form. That is creativity. And you can share these predictions by way of communication, cooperation, and copying. And that is how the five C's empower a brain to create and share social reality. Each of the five C's is found in other animals to varying extents. Crows, for example, are creative problem solvers who use twigs for tools. Elephants communicate in low rumbles that can travel for miles. Whales copy one another's songs. Ants cooperate to find food and defend their nest. Bees use abstraction as they wiggle their bums to tell their hive mates where they can find nectar. In humans, however, the five C's intertwine and reinforce one another, which let us take things to a whole different level. Songbirds use their songs. Songbirds learn their songs from adult tutors. Humans learn not only how to sing, but also the social reality of singing such as which, which songs are appropriate on holidays. Meerkats teach their offspring to kill by bringing them half-dead prey to practice on, like this half-dead scorpion that I'm showing in this picture here. We learn not only about killing, but also the difference between accidental killing and murder, and we invent different legal penalties for each. Rats teach one another what's safe to eat by marking palatable foods with an odor. We learn not only what to eat, but also which foods are main courses versus desserts in a particular culture and which utensils to use. Other animals such as dogs and great apes and certain birds also have brains that compress signals to a degree so they can also understand things abstractly to some extent. But as far as we know, humans are the only animal whose brains have enough capacity for compression and abstraction to create social reality. A single dog, like my beautiful Luna here, might develop her own social rules, like a particular grassy area is for playing with humans or that pooping is not allowed inside the house. But a dog brain cannot communicate these concepts to other dog brains efficiently, the way that a human brain can convey concepts with words to make social reality. Chimps can observe and copy one another's practices like poking a stick into termite holes to pull out tasty snacks, but this learning is based in physical reality, namely that sticks fit into termite holes. That's not social reality. If a troop of chimps agreed that whosoever pulls a particular stick out of the ground becomes king of the jungle, that would be social reality because it imposes a sovereign function on the stick that goes beyond the physical. Most animals have evolutionary adaptations that make them specialists in their niche. The niche is the part of the environment that an animal um, cares about that's important to the animal's well being. Um, like um, an, ant, an elk's antlers or an anteater's tongues, tongue. These are evolutionary adaptations. But humans became generalists. Evolution blended the five C's into a, portion, into a potion that spurs us to bend the world to our will, or to try, anyways. 
<laughs> All animal brains pay attention to things in their physical environment that are relevant to their well being and survival and ignore the other stuff. But humans don't just select stuff from the physical world to create our niche, we add to the world by collectively imposing new functions and then we live by them. Social reality is human niche construction. Social reality is an incredible gift. You can simply make stuff up like a meme or a tradition or a law, and if other people treat it as real, it becomes real. Our social world is a buffer that we build around the physical world. The author Linda Berry writes, we don't create a fantasy world to escape reality, we create it to be able to stay. Social reality is a huge, oh sorry, social reality can also be a huge liability. It's so powerful that it can alter the speed and course of our own genetic evolution. One example, is the tragedy of Romanian orphanage, orphanages, where a government, when a government's rules created a generation of humans who were effectively removed from the gene pool. Another example is China's one child policy, or was, I should say, because it's no longer in, in act, it's no longer active in which a culture that valued sons over daughters led to more male offspring than female and ultimately to millions of Chinese men who cannot marry Chinese women. This sort of artificial, artificial selection happens when, in every society where wealth, social class, or war empowers one group over another. And it changes the odds that certain people will reproduce with each other or at all. Social reality even changes the course of human evolution when we simply share our creative ideas, such as technology to burn fossil fuels, which has produced a physical world that is much less under our control. A really striking thing about social reality is that we often don't realize that we make it. The human brain misunderstands itself and mistake social reality for physical reality. For example, humans vary <laughs> tremendously, like every animal species does. But unlike the rest of the animal kingdom, we organize some of this variation into little boxes with labels. And we treat the label boxes as if they were part of nature. For better and for worse. We treat the labeled boxes as if they are part of nature for better and for worse. But in fact, we built those boxes. Here's an example of what I mean. The concept of race often includes physical characteristics, characteristics such as skin tone. But skin tone is on a continuum. And boundaries between one set of shades and another are placed and maintained by people in a society. Some people try to justify the boundaries by appealing to genetics. But while it's true that skin tone might be heavily influenced by genes, so are eye color, ear size, and the curvature of toenails. We, as a culture, choose the features of discrimination and draw dividing lines that magnify the differences between the group that we call us and the group that we call them. The lines aren't random, but they are not stipulated by biology either. And after the lines are drawn, people treat skin tone as a symbol for something else. And that is social reality. You uphold social reality by your everyday behaviors. You do it every time you treat sparkling diamonds like they have value, every time you idolize a celebrity, every time you vote in an election, 
every time you don't vote in an election. Our behaviors can also change social reality. Sometimes the changes are relatively small, like using the pronoun they to refer to a single person instead of a group. Other times the changes are cataclysmic, like the breakup of the former country of Yugoslavia, which led to years of war and genocide. Or another example is the Great Recession of 2007, when some people in fancy suits decided that a bunch of mortgages had dropped in value, and so they did drop, plunging the world into catastrophe. Social reality does have its limits. After all, it's constrained by physical reality. We could all agree that flapping our arms would let us soar into the air, but that won't make it happen. Even so, social reality is more malleable than you might think. People could agree that dinosaurs never existed, ignore all the evidence to the contrary, build a museum about a dinosaur-free past. We could have a leader who says terrible things, all captured on video, and then news outlets could agree that the, world, the words were never said. That's what, that's what happens in a totalitarian society. Social reality may be one of our greatest achievements, but it is also a weapon that we can wield against each other. And it's vulnerable to being manipulated. Democracy itself is social reality. Social reality is a superpower that emerges from an ensemble of human brains. It gives us the possibility to chart our own destiny and even influence the evolution of our species. We can make up abstract concepts, share them, weave them into a reality, and conquer just about any environment, natural, political, or social, as long as we work together. We have more control over reality than we might think. We also have more responsibility for reality than we might realize. Every type of social reality is a dividing line. Some dividing lines help people, like driving laws that prevent head-on collisions. Other dividing lines benefit some people and hurt others, such as slavery and social class. People debate the morality of such dividing lines, but like it or not, each of us bears some responsibility every time we reinforce them. A superpower works best when you know you have it. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett. That was great. We have a few questions and I wanna encourage folks to add more to the chat. I'm sorry, to the Q&A feature if you can. Uh, if, to the chat, if you can't figure out the q and A, is fine. Um, so I will start with um, John from DC's question. He says he's about two thirds through your new book and hasn't noticed a reference to the unconscious. Does your research support a distinction between conscious and unconscious processes? Uh, yes, it does. In fact, most of what goes on inside your brain is unconscious. Um, this was, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if, um, if you've made it up to um, lesson four, John, but lesson four is almost completely about un unconscious predictive processing in the brain. So um, I guess the best thing I could say is uh, this is a little book of essays. I couldn't cover everything. I was trying to cover stuff that I thought was sort of on the newer side and also really cool, you know, stuff that would um, allow people to entertain each other at dinner parties. Because like when I wrote the book, we were still going to dinner parties. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be going to dinner parties again. Um, but yes, yes. Um, most of what goes on inside your brain is unconscious. Most of what the, the predicting that your brain is doing um, and the guiding of your actions, you know, how your brain constructs your actions and um, initiates um, the construction of your experience. All of that is happening outside of your awareness most of the time. Thank you. Um, so 
Uh, this question says she thanks you for sharing your time with us and um, the examples provided are all of successful social reality at, at the point in your talk where she wrote this question. Oh, did I lose you? There we go. Um, excuse me. The examples provided are all of successful social reality and interaction. Is there research into the unsuccessful forms of communication based on compression and abstraction? And I don't know if this is related, it feels related. My question <laughs> is, um, how do you deal with um, values in your research? So for example, your examples of Trump and the news would be a negative. <laughs> um, but the Nazis were really successful in their <laughs> use of social reality. So how do you, I'm, I'm hoping those questions are related. Yeah, I guess what I would say, first of all, I just want to point out, I, I actually didn't mention anybody by name. So no, you didn't. I'm sorry. I, I did <laughs> really care. I was, I mean, I know, you know, I, Courtney, you and I live in Massachusetts. So, you know, but I mean, for just, just to be real, <laughs> nope, I take responsibility for that. Just to be clear, I, I think, you know, there's a really interesting book by Anne Applebaum um, um, about the, um, it's about the demise of democracy. It's a little book. It's about demise of democracy and the, um, the resurgence of um, authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And there are lots and lots and lots of examples um, from around the world, both historically, but also in the present moment. Yes. Um, um, where um, sort of collective denial is, is occurring about, about things that, you know, have been documented on film, um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I was really more pointing to, I was trying to more make the point that some of the things that we take for granted, like democracy, is social reality. The reason why um, little marks in a bubble on a piece of paper count as a vote is because we all agree, or most of us agree, <laughs> that, that that's the case. I, and that's it. That, that's the <laughs> basis of, of democracy, really. Um, and what a vote, you know, what counts as a vote. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess what I would say is, I think you have to separate um, whether social reality is successful or not from whether the outcome is beneficial to people or not. Mm -hmm. So social reality can be very successful as with in Nazi Germany. But I will say there, you know, even in, even in, in very, what, what most of us consider very dark times, um, there were people who didn't accept that social reality and who acted very, very differently sometimes. Um, uh, and sometimes it cost them their lives. You know, there, there were people who, who didn't accept um, the consensus of what everybody else was doing and believing. Um, and you can also see, I mean, what, there has to be some, um, some proportion of people in a group who agree and they don't have to agree verbally. They don't even have to be aware that they're agreeing. It can, you know, to go back to John's point, you, it can be happening really quite unconsciously. As long as your actions are in line with and uphold that social reality, you are upholding it. Um, where do we see social reality failing? I think, uh, look around right now. I wouldn't say social reality is failing, but I would say there's a really big debate going on about there are two at least really starkly different versions of social reality right now. Um, I'm not just not just politically, but um, but you know about for example how um, dangerous COVID is. This mm -hmm. is a really good example in my view of where social reality and physical reality, you know come to blows. And um, I actually wrote a, a couple of blog posts about this on my um, website, lisafeldmanbarrett.com. And Fast Company, someone, uh, a journalist interviewed me about this issue. And that was, um, you can access that um, article off my website, or you can just go to Fast Company. It was published last week. But, um, you know, typically, um, physical reality constrains social reality. 
right? We could all agree that we could walk through walls, but we can't, you know, and our agreement yeah. isn't going to change that. We could all agree that like glass is edible as food, but our agreement isn't really going to change that. Um, you know, usually it's the case that um, when physical reality and social reality are in conflict with one another, physical reality will win. Mm. And I think that's partly what you are seeing happening now with, you know, how, how um, about whether or not to wear masks and the debate over, you know, whether or not it's necessary to wear masks, whether it or not it's necessary um, to be careful about our biological residue with one another. I mean, we can, it doesn't really, we can all agree that it isn't, that a virus isn't contagious and we could all agree that it isn't necessary to wear masks, um, but viruses don't care mm -hmm. what, what we agree. They don't care the, about the reality that we make up and the stories that we tell ourselves. All they care is that we have a nice wet set of lungs. <laughs> so, um, I think it, there are many ways in which social reality can fail. One way it can fail is a bunch of people can withdraw their consent and then you have the collapse of something like the economy um, in 2007 or you can have a revolution um, like uh, we saw in Yugoslavia and we've seen um, you know, the, the, the civil war in the United States um, was a challenge to social reality, the social reality of the states at being a single country. Mm -hmm. um, and, but social reality can also fail um, when it directly contradicts physical reality and people um, lose their livelihood or their well being or their lives as a consequence. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I will move on to um, Nicholas's question. Uh, he's a PhD candidate studying the evolution of the brain in mammals to understand how and why humans are so cognitively unique. Um, what is your opinion regarding the future of human intelligence, especially considering the fast expanse of artificial intelligence and our growing need as a species to survive by using intelligent technologies? Um, well, that Nicholas, that's an interesting question. Um, do, is there a, an increasing need for humans to use technologies to survive? I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I suppose if we fail to wire the brains of young people uh, with the ability to farm and kind of, you know, fend for themselves, then maybe that's true. But um, I would say, uh, you know, the the there are a number of ways to think about the how brain evolution proceeds as you, as you know so you can think about it genetically in the sense of um you know what what kinds of um genetic alterations might occur because of how we um because of how culture shapes the way that people reproduce, who reproduces and how many uh, offspring they have and so on and so forth. Um, so you know, as you know, um, some of the genetic changes that have happened in the, um, the primate brain that give us the capacity, don't, don't just allow for compression, but allow us to compress and abstract in the way that we do, involve specific genetic changes in specific layers of the cerebral cortex um, that have to do with um, compressing new information and, and learning and so on. Um, I mean, I think what we know is that the human brain can't get any bigger than it already is um, uh, without, um, <laughs> you know, because a, a human female still has to birth a baby with that size of brain. And it's not really clear that brains can get any more complex than they are since um, uh, there's a limit really to um, the folding patterns and the number of neurons and the number of connections that can be fit into a brain of our size. So the place where um, uh, you know evolution might shape um, the human brain is by the other ways that information is passed from generation to generation. So it's not only genes that pass information from one generation to another generation. It's also cultural norms and practices because we have the kind of brain that we have, 
right? So babies' brains are born unfinished and they wire themselves to the world that we curate for them, both the physical world and the social world. And their brains are basically bootstrapping into themselves. Uh, the brain is bootstrapping into itself a model of that baby's body in the world, the world that it grows up in. And in this way, this is the way that cultural inheritance takes place. And so it's very possible, as you suggest, that um, when the environment that we curate, the world that we curate for an infant and for a child changes because of dependence on particular types of technology, because of experiences, new experiences that we give them or experiences that we fail to give them, um, that this can alter the flow of um, information from generation to generation just in the same way or in a similar way um, to the way that genes alter that flow. Um, so I wouldn't deny the fact that technology will, could alter um, the course of human evolution, um, but I, I, do, I, I guess I'm, I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't think any of us really know the direction or directions that that, that would take. Um, and I also, I guess I would, I would sort of push back a little bit on um, the assumption that we need technology, that we're sort of evolving in such a way that we're not wiring certain things into our brains or to the brains of our offspring um, who will then become necessarily dependent on technology. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not sure that that, I'm not sure that that's the case, actually. I guess time will tell. <laughs> Thank you. I have a probably simplistic question about artificial intelligence. Um, I'm wondering, I, I guess when you were talking about compression, it just sort of, um, I mean, I know that word in terms of video compression, and I was it's wondering- a similar, It's a similar concept, actually. Yeah, and how much have we mirrored our own brains in our creation or uh, discovery of computer science and artificial intelligence? Well, I mean, in some ways, I suppose, yes, you know, you could say um, uh, there's some superficial similarities like, you know, an MP3 and, you know, is sort of a sort of similar compression. You can talk about how the brain is compressing information in a lossy way mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what that implies for how brains work. But the, there are a couple of fundamental differences between the way that um, scientists build um, AI technology and the way that human brains work. One big difference, um, which I think is really interesting, but super important is that, you know, brains evolved for lots of reasons, I'm sure, lots of selection pressures, but one of your brain's most important jobs is to regulate the systems of your body. Mm -hmm. Your brain is attached to the rest of your body. Your body is a context for your brain that you carry around with you from the moment you're born until the moment that you die. And because of that, um, and there are certain, there are certain you know, constraints that that introduces, and there are certain um, dynamics that that introduces that are nowhere present in um, AI, it, typically in the way that um, uh, AI technology is built. It, I'm not saying that AI, in order to function like a human brain, has to be attached to a body, but your body's job, I mean, your brain's job is to basically predictively manage the systems of your body. And it has a bunch of checks and balances that it has to, that are working against one another. And until AI systems are built in a way that have to perform that kind of a task continuously, um, uh, I think they're gonna be very unlike human brains and they will work very much like unlike human brains. You know, you, you didn't evolve your brain didn't evolve so that you could see and think and, and feel. Your brain evolved to control your body and you think and feel and see in the service of controlling your body. That's not how it feels to you. It's not how it feels to me either, but it is what's happening under the hood. That makes sense. And something we need to remind ourselves. <laughs> um, okay, and along the lines of compression, again, Catherine asks a question, what happens to compression in the case of concussion? 
Um, well, com well, I suppose it depends on where the concussion happens. Um, and it also depends on what the consequence is. So are, um, are neurons being, are neurons dying? Are, um, is there shearing? Meaning, you know, axon, I mean, neurons aren't really wired. They're not soldered together. They, but they are, um, you know, embedded in a, in a chemical matrix and they, they have long projections called dendrites and axons. And if those tear or break in any way, then um, it means that uh, the, the neurons won't be communicating efficiently with one another at, or maybe at all. And that will interrupt the flow of information that is necessary for compression to occur. So exactly what will happen really depends on where the damage is and how serious the damage is. Um, but there are cases where um, concussions have led to um, uh, a person being unable to um, it's not so much that they can't learn new information and have that compressed. It's that, you know, there's always this sort of conversation in your brain between your brain re-implementing past experiences um, from the past in, in oftentimes in um, like taking bits and pieces of the past and integrating it in, and combining it in a new way. Um, to make a prediction about um, the information that the brain is about to receive and the new information which is coming in. You can think about this, these predictions or these um, uh, memories, you don't have a conscious experience of remembering, but your brain is constantly re-implementing, reassembling past experience to make sense of the information that's coming from the world and from your body on a moment to moment basis. If that information can't be decompressed, can't be um, cascade into the rest of the brain as a prediction, then um, a person will experience basically experiential blindness. They'll, the sounds won't have a meaning, um, visual um, changes in light won't have a meaning, and sometimes in concussion, that's what happens. It's like people lose their, um, lose their knowledge of the past because the brain can't re-implement past experience and um, uh, essentially in the decompression process, which you know is because the compression is lossy, the decompression is like a set of inferences that the brain is making. It can't make those inferences very well. And as a consequence, um, at first, um, people are very confused and they have a lot of trouble making sense of the sights and sounds and smells and so on that they're presented with on a daily basis. Okay, I'm going to move on to Guillermo's question, which is how to confront the subjectivity of the mind versus the brain's processes or biases to get a new Broaden paradigm focus on biocentrism instead of anthrop excuse me anthropocentrism. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, Maybe you I do. Think, <laughs> I think Guillermo will have to clarify that question because okay. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Okay, Guillermo, feel sounds free like, to add your question. Like a, sounds more like a statement than a question. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna move on to um, Joanne's question. She's a PhD candidate looking into the notion of predefined concepts like words of emotion as they're used in different domains, academia, news, and the public. Oh, I'm sorry, this is also a statement <laughs> of gratitude uh, for your previous work, how emotions are made. Okay, Thank next you. one. <laughs> um, Olivia studies neurobiology, and there's an ongoing theme of the quest for simplicity specifically to narrow down the complexities of the brain and conceptualize it in simple terms, like we are the processes of our neurons. Do you have any insights or beliefs of what makes you, Lisa Barrett Feld Feldman Barrett, our, 
our psychology, our memory, or our soul? What makes all of those things? I don't, I, I, maybe you and I are familiar with different um, traditions in neuroscience. I don't know any tradition in neuroscience that's attempting to simplify things. <laughs> I, I mean, I do know, I do know that there is a, uh, there is an effort um, to unify um, the explanation of cognition and emotion and perception and action into a common computational framework. And what I mean by that is, instead of asking, you know, where in the brain does emotion live, where in the brain does do thoughts and rationality live? Where in the brain does perception live? And so on. Instead of asking those kinds of questions and presuming that every word for every mental phenomenon we have, like decision making versus attention versus thinking um, versus belief uh, versus emotion versus perception, for every word that there's a, a, its own process with its own computational mechanism. Instead, there's a push in neuroscience right now, at least in some parts of neuroscience, to try to understand that all of these things are, all of these events, which by the way are very Western events, but very Western uh, way of, of conceiving of a mind, um, arise from the same computational framework uh, that um, the brain that that can be used to describe what what a brain is doing, um, so I think it, that's that is that is simplifying things in some way. But it's a it's a shift in the assumptions and um, the kind of commitments that scientists um, have in trying to understand how a brain creates a mind and how do mental features like your like the feelings that you have the the experiences of seeing and hearing and so on how do these mental features um your feeling of agency for example um uh, how do they arise out of a human brain that's in constant conversation with your body and the world um i think scientists are also really interested in the question not of where does your soul come from but more what is happening in a brain in conversation with a body that leads someone to the experience of having a soul. So again, you could say that um, the experience of having a soul is a mental feature. It's a mental feature that arises from a brain that works in a particular way. Um, and there are a set of scientists who are very, very interested in that question. But that's a very different kind of a question than where does the soul come from? Um, because that the, that phrasing implies that there is an immaterial soul that arises from a corporeal brain, and I, even scientists who believe in a soul, I don't think um, would presume that they could um, answer the question of how something immaterial arises from something material. I mean, they have enough problems trying to figure out what consciousness is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll read uh, Don's question. He's from Australia. He's a social worker and has been focused on the social construction of reality his whole career, particularly of gender. So it's great to see you integrating the social with the neuro. But how does your current thinking interact with polyvagal theory? I don't know if I'm saying that word right, That's which nice. focuses on the face and about helping a person to read or tone, how do I pronounce, vagus nerve, and effect regulation. Are there synergies with your work and that of Porges Shore? Yeah, thank you, Dawn, for that question. And I, I, I don't exactly have my time zones right, but if, I'm, if you're in Australia, that means it's really early in the morning for you, or yeah, really early in the morning. So, so special thanks to you for getting up early yes. or staying up really late. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm quite sure that I'm not going to give you an answer that's going to justify uh, th that degree of effort, but I, but I do appreciate your, your showing up. So um, I would say that um, there is real debate about um, uh, Porges's um, polyvagal theory. 
like real debate. Physio I mean, so Karen Quigley, who is a, a physiologist and a peripheral physiologist who co-directs the lab with me, our lab, um, uh, you know, is a, an expert in um, uh, the autonomic nervous system and um, afferent um, communication to the brain. And from her, I can tell you that um, there, there are real debates about uh, the details about um, polyvagal theory. That being said, the vagus nerve, which is for everybody who is not familiar with this um, anatomy, you know, as your brain, a, a, your brain is controlling the systems of your body, or at least you could say having a dialogue with the systems. Actually, it's controlling all of the systems in your body, controlling them, with the exception of your heart, which has its own internal kind of controller, the, the cells, and your gut. So in the case of your gut and your, and your heart, your brain is more like having a conversation. Sometimes I think it's more like your brain is having an arm wrestle with your gut and your heart and like, who's going to win? It's not always clear, but um, especially where your gut is concerned. Mm. But, um, but you know, mostly you could say, you know, it's, it's either a conversation or, or your brain is winning and, and it's in control. But as your brain is controlling, you know, your heart and your lungs and, and your liver and, and, um, and how much glucose is in your blood and how your immune system is working and so on, all, the, all of the cells and, and so on are also sending information back to your brain. And that happens up several different pathways, one of which is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve turns out to be super important, like really important um, source of communication um, between your gut and your brain. And it's also a really important source of communication between your respiratory system and your heart and so on and your brain. And one thing that, um, without getting too technical, because Don, I, I want to give you a really, I have a really cool technical um, thing to say, but it's not going to be meaningful to, to, to the rest of our friends here who, who have joined this conversation. So I guess what I would say is this, that one thing that your brain does, um, this is an important thing that's happening in one part of your brain called the hippocampus, um, and it's happening elsewhere too, but it's, the hippocampus is very, very important for what's called event segmentation or creating events. Like how does your brain know when one event ends and a new event begins? Because that's really what your brain is doing. It's, it's segmenting a constant, a constant stream of changes into events that have um, a, a beginning and an end. And how does your brain know like when the beginning of event, a new event is occurring and when that event is ending and, and, and another one is going to occur. So basically it's like the question is, how do you know when, when to make another volley of predictions to try to control behavior and create experience? How do you know when that's necessary? And one possibility that's very intriguing is that this information is coming from the vagus nerve. And that means through the, I mean, you know, through the basal forebrain to the hippocampus. And what that means is that your body, the state of your body may have something to do, have to, something to do with the, um, the transition of your thoughts and your, um, you know, so like when one thought ends and a new thought begins, or as your, as your mind is wandering, or as one feeling, you know, um, uh, ebbs and another begins to flow. And that would be like super intriguing. Um, so I, I would say up until now, we've largely assumed that the brain is controlling the body um, in, in most cases, but that, you know, it may end up being more like a conversation um, than it is like a, uh, a control or a controller and a controlee. And I think um, that's probably as much as I can say that will make sense to everybody else who's not a neuroscientist <laughs> in the audience. Thank you. Um, I have one more question uh, from Jayanti. 
Is there any other species other than humans that have created a social world, like in ants and bees, which typically live in a group as a society with assigned functions for each? So I guess, what are they missing that we have? Yeah, so this is a great question. And the question really is not usually asked in the way that you just asked it, which is it's why it's really neat that you asked it that way. Typically, the way the question is asked is, um, do any other animals have culture? where culture is a set of norms and practices that are passed down from generation to generation. And there the debate is, well, you know, you, there are animals that pass down habits to each other and, and sort of patterns of action. Like there's a troop of macaques that wash their food in the ocean before eating it. And it all stems back to, you know, a couple of animals, um, you know, several generations ago. And um, uh, it's clear that what's happening is what, what we would call cultural transmission, that when the babies are young, they, they, learn, they learn by observing to, um, to do what the adults are doing. And, and you know, their brains become wired to their environment. <laughs> and so they, they just pass it along um, uh, generation by generation. And there are a lot of animals that actually, well, not a lot, but like more than you might think, um, and not always monkeys and chimps. You know, there are birds, for example, that um, pass information down from generation to generation. And in fact, even bird song, I mean, birds have to learn how to sing and um, they learn from their, from their, um, their caregivers. Um, so I think there are a lot of examples of, of what you, you could call cultural transmission and, and therefore you, you could call culture. But social reality, I should also say, and there are a lot of animal species where the animals regulate each other's nervous systems. So bees and ants and termites and earwigs and so on, they, they regulate each other's nervous systems in really important ways. And they do it with chemicals and with touch to some extent. Um, and they definitely have um, roles that are designed to take care of each other uh, in various ways. Um, and, you know, other animals like mammals, like, like uh, rodents, for example, also are um, social. They, um, they regulate each other's nervous systems in, in important ways, and they use chemicals and touch, and they also use sound, hearing, and they use vision to some extent. Primates use all of those, and they use vision much, much more than, um, than, than rodents do. And humans, use, we use all of those ways to regulate each other's nervous systems, and we use words, right? So I can text three little words to a friend halfway around the world and she doesn't have to listen to my voice or see my face. She can just read those words and um, I can affect her breathing. I can affect her metabolism. You can read something in a, a, a history book or you can read the Bible or the Quran or you could read a poem from hundreds of years ago and it can change your, um, you know, it can change your heart rate, it can change your, your um, blood pressure, it can, uh, it can soothe you or enrage you, um, which means that there's a change in your nervous system. And so, you know, every, um, every capability, every ingredient that goes into making social reality individually can be found in other species. What's unique about humans is that we have them all in the same brain. And then we have the addition of um, the ability to do abstraction, which allows us to have words and language, which is yet another way that we can influence one another quite profoundly, actually. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's a real tricky thing. And this is something that I talk about, I believe, in lesson five. Um, which is that we are, you know, we are social animals in the traditional sense. We, 
um, care for each other's young. We have specialized roles that we play. In, um, we, um, we regulate each other's nervous systems. Um, so we have these socially dependent nervous systems that we've evolved to have. And if we don't have someone who's helping to tend to our nervous system, that actually makes it likely that we will die some number of years earlier. Mm. Um, that's what the evidence shows, meta-analyses looking at mortality in relation to loneliness and social isolation. You know, we, we weren't designed to um, manage our own nervous systems on our own. <laughs> mm. You know, we, we need help. And, uh, you know, other people support our nervous systems and we support theirs. Other people can bear, you know, could be a burden actually on our nervous systems and we can be a burden on theirs. So we have these socially dependent nervous systems and we live in a society, our society here and in many parts of the Western world that value individual rights and freedoms. That's a real conflict mm. between a physical reality and a social, real, a social reality. And, but it's such a, it's a reality that's so charged and so fraught uh, that some people are uncomfortable even point, point even, even if I point it out, even merely pointing it out is seen as um, a threat or um, something that needs to be challenged. Um, and it's just a reality. So, it's a phys like a, you know physical reality will always win <laughs> when uh, you know in a conflict with social reality. So um, assuming the social reality doesn't doesn't change the physical reality, right? So um, so I guess the point that uh, is which is to say that um, yeah there are many many animals who who do what we can do. Um, individual when we look at the individual abilities and and there are many animals who can do things we can't do and that we endow our superheroes with mm. you know because we wish we could do mm -hmm. but social reality as far as we know is something more than culture it's something more than just being social it's something more than having divided uh roles and it's something more than um just than culture it's that we make shit up we make it up, we give it a name, we all, if we all agree on it, it becomes real. Mm. And it actually can get under the skin to affect the very physical health and uh, the re very real reality of the physical health of people. Um, and that is something that as a culture, uh, you know, I think that we should be thinking a little more about, which is partly why I wrote the book. Thank you. I just had one more question um, about the book, um, which you just answered why you wrote the book, but I guess why did you write the book and then what was the hardest thing for you to explain to the lay person? What was the most exciting thing for you to explain to the lay person? Uh, well, I wrote the book for, you know, I, no one ever does anything for one reason, right? So I think we you know, we, we like to think in terms of simple single causes, but everything is multiply determined by lots of weak little interacting causes. So I wrote this book for a lot of reasons. One reason was uh, I wanted to write, I wanted to try my hand at writing a book of essays. I love reading essays and um, I thought it would be particularly challenging for me because as you've noticed, you know, brevity is not my strong suit. <laughs> And, um, and I'm a scientist, so I, I'm immersed in a world of details and really good essay writing and really good science writing is about knowing what to leave out. So that was one reason. I think another reason is that I was really hoping to entice people who don't think of themselves as interested in science to engage with scientific material, but in a way that, that they would find um, enjoyable mm -hmm. and that would leave them feeling like it was fun. And maybe they learned a couple of things and they just were, you know, kind of um, wondrous about that. So I, I was, I was really, um, hoping to, you know, I, I sort of designed the book as a um, 
kind of create your own adventure <laughs> um, in the sense that, you know, you could read the essays and that's it. And, you know, come away with a couple of nuggets of neuroscience from each essay and, um, you know, dazzle your friends uh, um, with all this cool stuff that you learned um, and leave it at that. For somebody who wants a more traditional popular science experience, they, they have the appendix, you know, which has a lot more material in it. And for anybody who wants to do a deep dive on some of the scientific details, there's a you know, hundred, couple of hundred web notes that people can go to and um, look for additional explanation and um, scientific papers and so on and so forth. So, um, so I, you know, I, I wanted there to be sufficient detail for anyone who wanted the detail, mm -hmm. but I also wanted to just have the essays kind of stand on their own so that, you know, to entice people to understand or give them a taste of how really fun and cool and interesting neuroscience can be. Um, the, uh, the, the, the hardest thing to explain to people, uh, prediction is really hard to <laughs> explain to people, like how, how is it that your brain is predicting? Like, what is it doing exactly? Because it's so counterintuitive. Or the fact that the way we experience the world, right, is that you see something and then you react. So first you have an experience and then you act. But actually what your brain is doing is not reacting, it's predicting. And the first thing it's doing in a prediction is um, preparing your action. Mm. So there are a lot of psychological theories that say, a psychological hypotheses that say, well, First you evaluate things and then you act. But that's really not true. At the level of the brain, an evaluation is a preparation for action. That's what it, me that's what it, that's what it means to make something meaningful, is that the brain is preparing to act in a particular way. It's changing its internal systems in order to prepare an action. And your experience, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, is a consequence of action preparation. It's not the other way around. It's not the way we experience it. And this holds some key insights, you know, about perennial questions of free will and responsibility. So I think that's a, that's a kind of hard one. That mm -hmm. was a kind of hard one. <laughs> um, trying to explain to people that brains that look really, really different from one another, like a lizard brain and a, you know, rat brain and a human brain, when you just look at the naked eye, they don't look at all the same, but they actually have all the same neurons. Like how the hell does that happen? Well, trying to explain that in a way that people would understand, um, who, who, the way that neuroscientists would understand even who don't, who don't know the molecular genetics. I thought that was pretty challenging. Um, I think the easiest one, really was um, essay three, uh, lesson three, which is that little brains wire themselves to their world. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows that it's important how we treat our children. I think everybody knows now anyways, um, that little brains are born under construction and that they take 25 years till they get to their adult form. And even then, you know, we're still, our brains are always under construction to some extent. But I don't think people really knew the extent to which that's true. And even I learned some really cool things about plasticity that I didn't know until that were discovered fairly recently um, that, I, you know, that are in the book. And I'm, I'm not going to divulge everything because I, I want some people who haven't bought it yet to, you know, to go mm -hmm. and read it. <laughs> but um, but I, I, think, I think maybe the magnitude is surprising, but I don't, I don't think anyone really you know, would read, I don't think if you said to someone, well, you know, babies wire, babies brains, you know, wire themselves to their world, <laughs> you know, babies brains are, you know, babies are learning. And so their brain, their brain wiring is changing. I don't, I don't think most people would be like totally like knocked over by that. I will say though, that, um, you know, before I understood something about brain development in neonates, I didn't think they were very interesting creatures, honestly. <laughs> like even my own baby, you know, when she was born, I was like, oh, look, it's a baby. I mean, I, I really, I thought that babies got much more interesting when they could. Interact. Yeah, but in an effortful <laughs> way, like where they're, where they're trying, you know, to interact with you. But actually, you know, learning about what's happening um, in a neonatal brain just made me look at babies 
really differently. I, and I remember I was, I was in New York um, when I was finishing up this lesson and um, I was in, um, uh, you know, Central Park and I was walking around and I, you know, all these people were there with their, with their newborns and, you know, in their little snugglies. And I was just like, I was like, these are really fascinating little creatures. Like, cause they were just like a sea of all these little brains. And I was like, this is so interesting. Um, so, uh, so I don't think I'll, I don't look at babies in the same way any, anymore, you know, as cute as they are, I am completely fascinated immediately by like, um, trying to imagine what are they, what's going on inside their little skulls. <laughs> wow. Well, I would just want to say thank you on behalf of the Whalen Library and everyone from, it seems, Australia to possibly India and Japan who have attended tonight. Thank you for coming. And um, best wishes for your book. And we are excited to read it and excited for the next one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for showing up. And thanks for your questions. And um, my husband is over in the corner here going, tell them about your website. Yes. Oh, my website <laughs> is lisafeldmanbarrett.com. Um, there's, uh, you know, there are podcasts, articles that I've written for the New York Times and other places. There are um, po um, blog posts and various other things. Um, so um, uh, please uh, visit if uh, it's of interest to you. And in general, I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming and thanks for asking your questions. And Guillermo, if you want to email me and ask me your question again, um, in a way, you know, I'm sorry that I didn't understand specifically what you were asking. Please do that. Um, and please put in the in the subject line like Wayland Library question because you know as you can imagine uh, my my inbox is kind of full. And again, Courtney, thanks to you and thanks to the library for for having me visit with you today tonight. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks. You too. Good night, Bye. everybody.